Well, what a sweet and glorious spirit of worship in this place. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Lewis, for that very gracious introduction. I'm going to go ahead and own it right up front. I am a little intimidated to be here this evening. I know that the people who come to this conference are serious Bible students. And uh, you got your Greek New Testaments and your systematic theologies and your Bible digital programs. And so, uh, yeah, I was intimidated. I was confiding all this to my wife, confiding it to her this morning. And uh, she said, hey, she just need to not worry about it. She said, whatever you do, don't try to be, you know, just don't try to be intellectual or witty or funny. Just be yourself. Uh, so <laughs> I was not even sure how to take that, but it sounded like good advice. You know, truth be told, I've actually um, been begging Pastor John to let me be a part of this conference for years. Um, the first time I met Pastor John, we were speaking at, a, at an event together, and he came up, and he was just super complimentary of my message, and I told him, I was like, hey, I'd love to come and preach that message at the Desiring God Conference. And he kind of choked a little bit. He's like, well, well, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Your, your message was good, but you're not quite ready for a Desiring God Conference. So I went back, and I, I finished up my PhD in theology. I sent him a copy of my degree, I mean, a copy of my dissertation that got turned into a book, and I called him a few months later, and I'm like, hey, did you have a chance to, he said, yeah, but read your book, and I was like, well, I'd like to come and talk about the concepts of the next Desiring God concept. He said, son, you're just not ready for a Desiring God concept. A couple of years ago, we were at the Cross Conference, and uh, again, I got preached, and he came up, the first person to come talk to me afterwards, and he was super complimentary of my message, and gracious, and affirming, and I'd just been elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and I was like, Dr. Piper, I think I'm ready. He said, no, son, I just, I just feel like you're still not ready, and I was like, Dr. Piper, I don't understand. I mean, I've got a PhD in theology and I've published some books and, and I just, I was like, I just want to come. I'll come for free. He said, now, son, you are ready to be at the Desiring God <laughs> Conference. So, parts of that story aren't true, like the main parts, but the sentiment is true. The sentiment is true. It is true that I have loved this conference for many years. I have been as a participant and uh, when I could not be here, I listened to many of the sessions online. And so when Dr. Piper asked me to speak, I was a little intimidated that the topic that he gave to me was the second coming of Christ. At first, I thought I was the only one speaking on that topic at this conference. And so I was doubly nervous. Uh, I was relieved to find out that every speaker was speaking on that theme. But still, you understand, there are so many places to misstep. Um, I will tell you that I grew up in a church that was somewhat obsessed with the second coming. On our Sunday school walls, we had posters with dates and pictures of dragons and names of politicians. We had our annual, some of you think I'm joking and I'm not joking in the slightest bit. We had our annual prophecy conferences, which were the best attended events of the year for special Sunday night services. We watched the Billy Graham movies about the tribulations, uh, the tribulation. We had our rapture board games and our rapture bumper stickers. In case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. And we made rapture jokes like there was no tomorrow. Um, as As a kid, this is not an exaggeration, I'm telling the, the truth here, I, I lived in perpetual fear of being left behind long before the movies had come out. If for any reason, if for any reason, as an eight, nine, 10 year old, I could not find my parents or they didn't respond in the house when I called to them. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I'm not the only one who grew up like this. I would run through the house yelling, mom, mom, just sure I was gonna find her clothes in a neat little pile on the floor. <laughs> I had this recurring dream. I had it at least four or five times where the rapture happened. And again, this is not a joke. I got lifted, uh, I dreamed that I got lifted up to the top of my house. And then as everybody else went up to meet Jesus in the sweet by and by, I would drop back down to the earth, <laughs> revealing that my worst fear had come true. My faith in Christ was not strong enough to get me all the way to heaven. And when the roll was called up yonder, I'd still be here. And then when I was in high school, a little book came out they got instant popularity. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. Anybody remember that book? Anybody have a copy of that book? Yes, we read it. It was a big deal at my Christian school. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, my soccer coach after, on the because he gave a three-day window, remember, because he said, you can't know the day or the hour, but Jesus never said you couldn't know the three-day window, so it's going to be in these three days. And after soccer practice on the third day, my coach got us all together in the bleachers. He said, we're just going to spend the last 30 minutes of practice just waiting. He said, and if the rapture comes, he said, J.D., make sure that all the equipment gets put back into the, 
into the place. Wasn't helping. Again, that's a true story. Of course, you know, that day came and went that September of 1988. Then the next year, the same author released 89 reasons why Jesus was going to come back in 1989. He said he had miscounted the, the, the Gregorian calendar, which of course happens to the best of us, but uh, <laughs> 1989 came and went as well. Now, I'm grateful for a lot of the heritage I grew up with. I'm grateful for a church that taught me to love the Bible, love missions, believe the gospel, but I have since learned that some of how we approach this topic lacks some balance. But if you will let me be charitable for a moment, there is one thing that I believe that, that my generation that I serve now is missing that we lived with back then, and that was the earnest expectation of his return. My pastor would often end our church services simply by saying, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. And then he would say, and that could be today. And it could be today, and I really felt like that could be true. Let me just say right up front, I know that we have disagreements in this room about the timing of Jesus' return and the disagreements about what phrases like thief in the night really mean, friendly disagreements, I hope, intramural disagreements, and I certainly have my own convictions, as I'm sure you do also, but I'm not preaching tonight as a pre-tribber or a post-tribber or a no-tribber or any kind of tribber. Instead, I want to talk about something that I think all of us should have in common. And that is the need to conduct our ministries with the understanding that eternity is real and that the Lord is at hand. And specifically, I want to discuss how this shapes or how it is supposed to shape our approach to global missions. This doctrine might be one of the most, if not the most, neglected doctrines in the contemporary church. Seems like a lot of theologians find this doctrine embarrassing. It's the crass, uneducated uncle of Christian theology. But get this, and we might have already heard this at this conference. I missed the first few sessions. But the second coming of Christ is the most talked about doctrine in the Bible. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to the second coming. It's one out of every 13 verses that mentions it. For every one prophecy in the Bible concerning Christ's first advent, there are eight that talk about his second. We've got an entire holiday that celebrates the first coming, but we barely mention the second any longer. Furthermore, for every moral command given in the New Testament, every single one is tied at the second, to the second coming at some point. I remember my pastor he used to say, how could we call this doctrine non-essential? It's in every chapter. Every command is tied to it. To miss this doctrine is to miss the whole hope and thrust of the New Testament. Surely I come quickly, even so come, Lord Jesus. Jesus describes the posture of faithful servants as one of eager anticipation of his return. So if you've got your Bible this evening, I want you to take it out and turn it on and go down to Luke chapter 12. One of the other things I used to remember my pastor saying is he used to, sweetest sound he ever got to hear was the sound of the ruffling of the pages as people opened their Bibles. So if you have a paper Bible, just make a lot of noise with it. I would appreciate that. As a pastor of mostly millennials in our church, I never get to hear that sound anymore. I get to see the warm glow of God's word on their faces. And that's... uh, (laughs) I'll take either version. Luke chapter 12. Here's what Jesus says. It's pretty typical of how he talks about the second coming, beginning in verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. So that they may open the door to him at once. When he comes and knocks, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at his table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or even in the third and he finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, well, he would not let his house, not left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. But if those servants, jump down to verse 45, if those servants, switching analogies slightly, says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and to get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and he will put him with the unfaithful which means at one point he had been regarded to be with the faithful. 
he's placed now with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, that servant will receive a severe beating. Faithful servants in Jesus' parables here are described as those in a posture of waiting, awake, ready for the master. In the second hour, the third watch of the night, listening for the rap at the door, which could come at any moment, dressed for action, lamps burning. What I want to do in my time here with you is I want to explore what a posture of waiting implies in Scripture and how that relates to world missions. Two of these reflections are going to come directly out of our passage. One more we're going to gain from stepping back and taking this theme of waiting and looking at it in its broader context in the New Testament. So here they are. Number one, waiting in the New Testament means wakefulness to our task. Staying dressed and keeping our lamps burning means being awake to what his will is. And busy, he says about it, blessed, verse 7, are those whom the master finds awake and active at the task when he comes. And what is that task, of course? What would have to be Jesus' last words to his church, his marching orders? As you're going, preach the gospel to all the ethne, to the ends of the earth. In Ephesians 5.15, Paul tells us to wake up, O sleeper, and do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and make the best use of time because the days are evil. What is that will of the Lord that we are supposed to wake up to? 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. For as it is written, Luke 24, this gospel of repentance of sins will be preached at all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. The prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament would present redemptive history like a river that flowed out of the throne in Jerusalem, going all the way to the Dead Sea, which represents, of course, the the lost Gentile nations. And as the river flows toward those nations, it gets deeper as it goes. The revelation gets more full. People begin to understand more about the gospel, but the whole time, the whole point is getting the gospel to the nations depicted in the Dead Sea. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John reveals the telos of history what our worship leader, our brother read just a moment ago. A vast throng of people of every tribe and tongue and nation under heaven gathered together in grateful worship around the throne of the Lamb. This is what God is doing. This is what his will is. It's like C.J.H. Wright says in his book, The Mission of God, every single passage of scripture has to be interpreted in light of that mission. And if you don't know how the the particular passage you're preaching on ties into that mission, you have interpreted it wrongly. The mission series is not one series a year that you do in some month where you spend three or four weeks talking about missions. Any passage of scripture rightfully interpreted and preached is always going to tie into this mission of what God is doing. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus tells us, in fact, that the end will not come until the gospel of the kingdom has been preached throughout the whole world. Now, again, I realize that there is some question about what exactly Matthew 24, 14 indicates about the timing of Jesus' return. When Jesus says that, that the end will not come until the gospel has been preached in all the different nations of the earth, is he saying that that he will not come until we have penetrated the last ethne, however that is defined, until we've done it with the gospel as if it's like a condition of his return, that in some ways we are kind of in control of when he comes. That's how preachers 100 years ago would often talk about it. They would talk about hastening the return of the king. And the more that we, the quicker we can get the gospel out there, the more we hasten his return. Some certainly look at it that way. Others respond, they say, well, no, the Lord being at hand or standing by the door or ready to come like a thief in the night indicate that there's nothing that prohibits Jesus coming except his own sovereign choice, regardless of the status of world evangelization. And the book of Revelation indicates, they say that in the next iteration of the last days called the tribulation, God will bring about the repentance of Israel and the commissioning of the 144,000 witnesses. And these things will expedite the completion of the Great Commission, and that's what Paul is referring to in Romans 11 when he says that if the falling away of Israel was a blessing to the Gentiles, the salvation of Israel will be even more so. And they say Matthew 24, 14 is not a condition we must fulfill before Jesus' return. It's just a statement about what will happen before it's all said and done. Now, again, my point tonight is not to discern which of those two interpretations is most correct. Just to say, at the very least, 
that this verse tells us where history is headed and what we should be doing. It's like George Ladd said in reflection on this verse, what we do know is that Christ has not yet returned and therefore the task has not yet been completed and that shows me what I must be doing. Maybe most importantly, this verse assures us of our success in getting the gospel to the nations. I spent the first few years of my ministry as a, as a missionary in Southeast Asia in a Muslim unreached people group. I don't think I've ever had a more frustrating season of ministry than those years when it just seemed like every time I shared the gospel, it was thrown back in my face. Hundreds of gospel conversations that didn't seem to go anywhere. And about a year into my time there, I just, I was ready to give up like many missionaries are. And I thought, it's just no use. The obstacles are too, the, the, the objections are just too strong. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know how to accomplish it. And my a mentor in my life, a missions professor, remember he walked me outside when I was just confessing to him how close I was to, to, to quitting and giving up. He walked outside, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I want you to look up every single night that you feel like that. And I want you to look at these stars that God has strewn throughout the heavens because they're here as a reminder that God promised Abraham that he was going to have sons and daughters like the stars that are in the sky. And when God pointed these out to Abraham, it was the same stars that you're looking at. And some of those stars that he looked at represented not just you and your family, it represents the Achenese people to whom you have been sent. And Jesus shed his blood to guarantee it will happen. So it does not matter how discouraged you feel. It does not matter how defeated it is. God promised it will happen. And because God promised it will happen and because he's given the stars as a reminder and his blood as a pledge, you can press through these times and seasons of difficulty. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but you're gonna receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and as sure as there are stars in the sky, you are going to have fruit. It may not come in your lifetime, but it is going to happen. Jesus promises his power in special ways for those who are engaged in that mission. The promise that Jesus gives in Matthew 28 that he will be with them to the end of the age is a promise that's given in context of the Great Commission. I, I certainly don't wanna over apply or isogene something here, but there is an implication that the presence of Jesus is with his church as they are doing what he is telling them to do. So let me just take you another place where he says that John chapter 12, the space where the Greeks came to Jesus and they said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. And they come to Jesus and say, the Greeks are here to see you. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, foretelling what their ministries would be like, right? unless it dies, it's gonna abide by itself, but if it dies, it's gonna bring forth much fruit. He then says, the next verse, if anybody serves me, he must follow me and where I am, there my servant will be also. Where I am, in context, what he is talking about, it has to be is with these Greeks because that's where I'm going to commission you to go. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're gonna be my witnesses there and I'm gonna go with you to the end of the age and where I am, you're going to be if you're really my follower. Even the image of Ezekiel's river implies as much. That river of life bringing healing to the nations gets deeper as it goes toward the nations. There is a part of the heart of every believer, every follower of Jesus that God has created to not be fulfilled until it is somehow captivated in what God is doing around the world. Whether you are called to go, whether you are called to stay, there is something in all of us, every church member, that is supposed to be engaged heart and soul in this. It's not Christianity 401. It's not something that you do many years later. It's something that God put into us as a yearning for his presence. Let me say something I fear, I hope it's not any controversial. All faithful preachers of God's word experience the power of God in and through their ministries. No one would ever be saved if we didn't experience that, right? But I will tell you that those on the front lines of unreached people group work experience, it seems to me, an unusual outpouring of his power. Not only do I see implications in our Bibles, like the ones I'm giving you, I've experienced too much in the field and I've heard too many stories to really question that. I've been a part of bringing seven Muslims to faith in Christ personally. Of those seven, whose names I know, five of them came through some kind of supernatural dream. Remember the first one happened. It was um, 
I got a telephone call. It was about 11 o'clock one night from a Christian friend who lived about three hours from where I was over in Southeast Asia. And he said, hey, I need your help. And I was like, why? He said, you know, I can't tell you on the phone. He says, because you know they're listening. And it was true. They listened to our phone conversations. He said, just come down and meet me at the place. I knew where the place was he was talking about. So I got on a bus, night bus, got down there about two in the morning, went to this little out of the, you know, out of the way place. And I go in there and there was a 32 year old man in there, a Muslim named Fajar with my Christian friend. And my Christian friend said to Fajar, I said, tell him, tell him what you told me. And Fajar said, he said, well, he said about a month ago, he said, I had this, I guess you would call it a dream. I've never had anything like it. He said, I was in this field. He said, and I was just walking for what felt like days to this field, as far as I could see to the front of me, to behind me, to the right, to the left. He said, there was just nothing in this field. He kind of paused and he said, ironically, this is a little bit what my life feels like. I'm a very committed Muslim. He said, but I feel like I'm just lost. I feel like I don't know where I'm going in, in life. He said, after walking around for what felt like days, he said, suddenly I heard a voice behind me from somebody who wasn't there before. And when I turned around, he said, there was this, I guess you would call him a man, but he was in this white clothing and his face, matahari is what he said. It, it shone like the sun and I couldn't look at him. He called my name and said, Fajar, he reached inside of his robe and he pulled out a copy of the Injil, which is their word for gospel. And he said, Fajar, this is the only thing that will get you out of this field. He said, I pulled back because I knew I could not touch that. That was Christian and I am Muslim and I did not want to even touch it. He said, the moment I pulled back, he said, I woke up in my bed and I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. He said, second night I went to sleep, I had the exact same dream. Again, he said, I, I walked for what felt like days in the midst of this field and Again, he said, he appeared behind me and he called my name and he reached out the copy of the NGO and he said, Fajar, I'm telling you for the second time, this is the only thing that will get you out of this field. He said, this time I wanted to take it. He said, I could feel myself shaking. He said, I just couldn't work out the strength to take it. He said, I woke up in my bed and I knew that I'd made another terrible mistake. He said, the third night I did not even want to go to sleep. He said, sure enough, I closed my eyes and sleep and I opened them and he said, there he was. This time there was no walking, it was just me and him. And he said, he looked at me and he said, Fajar, this is the last time I'm gonna tell you. This is the only thing that is gonna get you out of this field. He said, this time I watched my hands. He said, they're almost involuntary. He said, I couldn't control them. I just reached up and I took this copy of the NGO and I held it to my, my chest and I squeezed it. He said, I woke up peacefully in my bed the next morning. He looks at me and he says, now my friend, points at my Christian friend, my friend tells me you are expert at Injil. <laughs> so can you tell me what my dream means? Now brothers and sisters, I went to the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, okay? <laughs> we did not have a special class on dreams and the interpretation thereof. But I am pleased to tell you in that moment, I knew exactly what to say. I was like, brother, you were so in luck. Dream interpretation is my spiritual gift, okay? <laughs> And I sat there and I walked him through for about an hour and a half, Genesis to Revelation, and just explained to him who God was and what he had done. I remember getting him into the Gospel of Matthew, and I remember these big old tears welling up in his eyes, and he said, so you're telling me that God, God, the Creator, died for me? And I said, yes, that's what Christians believe and the Bible teaches Remember, he holds out his hands like this. He says, Allah, walk by. I was like, we got some discipleship to do. But yes, God should be praised. <laughs> we get to the end of my gospel presentation. And I was like, Fajar, do you want to trust Christ? And he said, oh, with all my heart. I said, well, now I knew one way to do this. And then I'd say, so I'm like, every head bowed, every eye closed. Why don't you repeat after me? And, <laughs> you know, we get about two phrases into that. We get about two phrases into that sinner's prayer, and I said, Fajr, stop, hold on. I was like, you understand that this is a big deal. Because when you put faith in Christ, the New Testament tells you you're supposed to be baptized, and we're going to baptize you. And when you get baptized, you know that draws a line in the sand that might get you kicked out of your family. It might get you fired from your job. And you and I both know of people in this community that have lost their lives because of this. And they're forgetting, he smiled, he looked back at me, he said, of course, I know that. 
So why do you think it took me a month to work up the courage to come and talk to you? He said, but in that month, he said, I decided, he said, I knew that you were going to tell me that that person in my dream was Jesus. I knew it. And I knew enough about what Christians believed to know that you were probably going to tell me that Jesus was God who died on the cross for me. And during that month, I decided that if that is what he had done for me, then there's not anywhere that I wouldn't go with him. So I said, why don't you lead me in the sinner's prayer? Because I feel like I need to get saved right now. I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that God doesn't use normal means in those kinds of places. But I'm just saying that there is a special power that God gives to the church that gives itself away for the Great Commission. And Jesus told us, he said, this is what you're supposed to be about. Don't be foolish. Understand what my will is. Understand where I'm going to be. Understand where my power is going. Know where this river is flowing. Because to wait on me means to be wakeful to that task and to be about it. And there's a special power that awaits us that gives us boldness in our proclamation and makes us undeterred by any opposition. Number two, waiting in the New Testament means faithfulness to our charge. Faithfulness to our charge. Sobering in this parable to me is Jesus' description of the servants who forget their master's return, who live without an awareness of his eminence. What they do, they begin to misuse and abuse those provisions that the master has put under their care. Now, there certainly are many ways that we could apply that, but being in a room full of pastors... I want to apply it to us. I don't think this is a stretch because as I pointed out when I read it, these people, it's implied at least that they were faithful. They're called servants. They're not people outside of the camp. They're inside the camp. Forgetting the imminence of his return causes us to misuse the resources that he has given us and turn what God gave us for the task back on ourselves. C.S. Lewis famously said, wealth has a way of knitting a man's heart to this world. Success, the acclaim of others, the financial privileges that come with a big successful ministry, serving in a land of freedom and privilege have a way of knitting a pastor's heart to this world. Like these servants, it is easy for a pastor to become besotted with the pleasures of this life that are afforded to you when you have a successful ministry, which inevitably leads to abusing that ministry. Let me just tell you how God showed this to me. It was a Friday afternoon. I'd taken a a day for prayer and fasting to pray for a great awakening to come to the city where I pastor, Raleigh, Durham, the Triangle area of North Carolina. And I spent the whole afternoon praying. And I was praying that God would send an awakening to our city The kind of thing you would write about in the history books. The kind of thing that you would say changed the trajectory of the city. I certainly do not claim to be a guy that God speaks to all the time and is whispering things in his heart and writing stuff in his Cheerios. I'm not that guy. But this is one of those times when the Holy Spirit puts an impression in your heart that might as well be audible. It's so clear. And it was with all as if the Holy Spirit just said, okay, what if I say yes to that prayer? And what if I send an awakening into the triangle that would redefine the whole trajectory of the city? But what if I don't use your church to do it? What if your church stays the same size? What if it's your friend's church right down the street? You know, the one whose attendance you're checking out all the time? What if his church grows and your church stays the same and 10 years from now, when they talk about this awakening, they don't even bring your church up? You still want me to do it? Now, y'all, I know the right answer to that question. Oh, yes, Lord, you must increase and I must decrease. I know the right answer. But that wouldn't have been the real answer. And in that moment, I realized that I'd stood up in front of my church and said, thy kingdom come. And what I actually meant was my kingdom come. Ministry is a great place for guys with the idol of success to hide. Because we can cloak all of our selfish ambition in the garments of zeal for the kingdom. And it was shown 
but the jealousy that I had for the success of the ministry of others and how badly I wanted my name to be tied to anything that God did. I was like that pastor that Robert Murray McShane describes, who is redirecting the attention of the bride of Christ away from the bridegroom and onto himself. I mean, think about it. That's what John the Baptist is talking about in that analogy, right? That he must increase, I must decrease statement. John, the Baptist says, I'm like the best man. I mean, what's the role of the best man at the wedding? Well, traditionally, the role of the best man is to make sure the wedding happens, right? So he stands right up there next to the, to the bridegroom. You've, even the way we do weddings today, that door opens, and there she stands in all of her resplendent glory, and here you got the guy, the bridegroom, and every eye's looking at him and looking at her and kind of watching the, the fireworks go back and forth and seeing if he gets a tear in his eye. Imagine you're watching the best man standing right behind the bridegroom, Again, this is McShane's, he didn't do all this with it, but he, he used this example. He said, imagine that all of a sudden you notice that the best man is leaning out from behind the bridegroom and he's making eyes at the bride. He's trying to get her attention and he's trying to distract her as she walks down the aisle. What is the bridegroom going to do? He's gonna turn around and punch the man in the throat. Well, he ought to do. It's like, this is not your role, it's to steal her attention. Your whole role is to bring her to me. When you and I forget that the Lord is at hand, that he is there at the door, it just becomes really easy to start craving the attention of the bride and not to prepare her for the bridegroom. Around this time, I'd begun to study the promises of Jesus in the New Testament regarding the spread of the gospel and the success of his church. And here's what I discovered. It was revolutionary, and it coupled with the other thing. Kind of rewrote the ministry that God had given me. All the promises of Jesus, all of them, about the spread of the gospel are tied to raising up and sending out, not gathering and counting. Promises like John 14, 12. Truly, truly, Jesus says, John 14, 12, I say to you. You understand truly, truly is a little marker. I mean, Jesus... Jesus did not have to clarify when he was telling the truth. He was not in the habit of telling lies. He didn't have to stop and say, hey, guys, now I'm actually being serious. Whenever you see a phrase like truly, truly, it's like him clapping his hand saying, hey, what I'm about to tell you is so mind-blowing that if you don't pay attention, it's gonna go right over your head. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I am doing and greater works than he, these he will do because I'm going to the Father. Greater works than Jesus? Honestly, anybody here done greater works than Jesus? Raised the dead, fed the 5,000 with a Hebrew happy meal? Anybody, even if, you, even if you take out the miracles, anybody ever preached with greater power than Jesus would have preached the Sermon on the Mount? You ever counseled a woman with greater insight than Jesus counseled a woman in John 4? You ever prayed with a better understanding of the mind of God than Jesus prayed in John 17? Has there ever been anything you have ever done that could be called greater than what Jesus did? Well, of course not, at least in one sense. That's why theologians say that greater doesn't mean greater in the quality of the works that we do. It means greater because we're testifying with full knowledge of the resurrection, but it also means greater in the extent, they say. Because the reach and the extent of the works of Jesus will be greater when Jesus' spirit rests on every believer than when that power was concentrated on one person, even when that person was Jesus himself. Up until then, the Holy Spirit's power had primarily been concentrated on one person in one location in the incarnation. And now the power of his spirit, now that Jesus has returned to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to earth, now that power of the spirit would be available wherever Jesus' followers were and the overall extent would be greater than if Jesus himself stayed. Friends, how we build our churches turns that principle on its head because we celebrate churches and pastors who gather great audiences around themselves. But the greater works that Jesus spoke of are accomplished when ordinary believers are raised up and sent out. Earlier, I brought up what Jesus said to his disciples in John 12 when the Greeks came up to him. Sometimes I think we fail to see how significant of a moment this was in redemptive history. Since Abraham, we've been talking about bringing the nations back to worship. And now in John 12, they're coming to see Jesus. This is a pivotal moment in redemptive history, which is what makes Jesus' next comment so significant. 
Because instead of turning to the Greeks, he turns back to his disciples and he tells them what has to be true about them if these Greeks in the future are going to actually come to know him. Here's what he said. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever loses his hates his life in this world is going to keep it for eternal life. When you step back for a minute, it actually is kind of an odd analogy. I don't think of a grain of wheat, a seed, going into the ground and dying. I think of a grain of wheat of going into the ground as just beginning to live. But it does die. In one sense, its outer cohesion as a seed erodes. You can no longer grind it up and eat it for food. You have given it to the earth and it is destroyed as a seed. But out of that comes a plant that can produce hundreds and thousands of seeds. And Jesus said to his disciples, that's how you're going to have to see your ministry. Not as something to be gathered and counted, not as something to be built, but as something to be sown and given away. Honestly, I realized this wasn't how I saw my ministry. Not as a, I didn't see it as a seed to scatter, I saw it as something to build. That's not what you do with a seed. And so we rethought our whole strategy as a church. And rather than being a church that focused on building its seeding capacity, we said from now on, our success, if we're going to measure it in any earthly way, we're going to measure it by our sending capacity. And so every year now, we bring on three or four apprentices onto our staff. We pay their salary. We give them nine months, and they got one job. And that is they get a headhunting license at the Summit Church. You recruit anybody that you can take with you to go and plant these churches in the United States and overseas. Just this last month, we sent out our 1,250th member who has left our church to go and be a part of one of these church plants. I'll just go ahead and tell you straight up, every single one of those 1,250 is a painful loss because in case you don't realize it, the kinds of people that volunteer to go on church plants are not sideline people. They're people that are leading ministries. They're people that are friends of yours. They're people who are elders in your church. I remember one of the first times we did this and I, I got the, the four residents, the four planters in the room and I was like, all right, tell me who all you're, you've recruited to take. And they started to list name after name. And I was like, stop. Like, <laughs> did I get some take backs or something? Like you get five of these. I mean, they were just going through and I'm hearing the names of ministry leaders and worship leaders and big givers. Not that I know who gives what, but big givers. I'm hearing their names and... <laughs> And I'm like, what is happening? And none of these guys saw it. I took my hands off the table where I was sitting. I just put them underneath that table and I stretched them out. It was an act of surrender and faith because I was like, Lord, this has got to be your church. And if you want to grow this church big and give it great leaders so we can reach the community, then that's up to you. But if you want to take out some of the best leaders that we have and scatter them like seed all across the face of the earth so that we never see them again, then that's okay too, because this church doesn't belong to me, it belongs to you. God's multiplied it. So far, those 1,250 members have planted 298 churches. I just had a report put on my desk a couple weeks ago that shows for every one member that we've sent out, there are 30 new people worshiping in the kingdom. The historian Rodney Stark says that the clearest correlation between any gospel movement and its future is the amount of new pastors it is raising up. How many is your church raising up? What's your sending capacity? I know not everybody in here is Southern Baptist. In fact, the majority of you might not be Southern Baptist, but the president of the North American Mission Board, which is a Southern Baptist North American church planting arm, says our greatest need right now is not more money, it is qualified planters. We have a dearth of qualified planters. Paul Chitwood, president of the International Vision Board, says the exact same thing. We got open spots and we can't fill them because churches aren't producing them any longer. Brothers, faithfulness to our master means building his kingdom, not our own, which means devoting yourself to planting and multiplying, not gathering and counting. Because God only multiplies what we sow. And by the way, we have found this, just in case you're panicking right now, is that in this area, as in all other areas, you can't outgive God. Seems like for every one leader we give away, God raises up three new ones in their place. Interestingly, pastors, we know how to teach this principle to our members in regards to their money, don't we? I mean, I've never stood up and said, hey, if you got some extra money laying around at the end of the month that you can't figure out what to do with, God is a really good option. 
No, we tell them, give your first and your best. Give what you can't afford. Give your first and your best and watch how God multiplies it. You can't outgive God. I wonder if sometimes our people don't believe us when we tell them that about their money because they don't see us doing that with the resources of our church. God says, give your first and your best. Give it away. Life in the world only comes through death in the church. Faithful servants see their ministry resources not as treasures to hoard, but as seed to give away. It's like Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ bids a man to follow, he bids him not come and shine, not come and grow, but come and die. Brothers, this is serious stuff. I mean, think about how Jesus talks about it here. These servants who abuse the master's resources, who were drunk on the pleasures of the world, receive incredibly harsh treatment. Another unnerving parable that God used in my heart when I was going through all this was the parable of the talents where the master gives to one five and one two and one one. You understand the parable and the one who takes five and multiplies it to 10 and two, four, and the one who got one just buried it. What was unnerving to me is what Jesus said to that one servant when he came back. Do you remember this? You wicked servant. My, my question is, just based on what's written, what wicked thing had he done? He didn't take the money and blow it on gambling or prostitutes or he didn't steal it. He gave it all back. 100% of what we was given, he gave back. And Jesus called him wicked. Because evidently there's more than one way to be wicked in the kingdom of God. You can be wicked through an egregious violation of the Ten Commandments. You can become wicked through a disregard of God's word. But you can also become wicked by failing to use what God gave you for the mission and instead turning it back around for yourself. And I have to wonder if there are thousands of faithful churches in the United States who are doctrinally sound, whose pulpits preach truth every single week but are still regarded by the master to be wicked because their ministries are building up, not giving away. This is serious, serious stuff. I think of the words here of Adoniram Judson. Oh, it just bless my heart. When we sang, the first thing we sang was in Burmese or Myanmar. Adoniram Judson, Lord, hasten the day when no faithful church can bear to sit under Sabbath privileges without some of its number representing them on foreign fields. How can a faithful gospel church not have at least one for every 50? How can we be satisfied, he said, with 50 believers that not one of the 50 God would raise up and send out? Waiting means faithful, wakefulness to our task. It means faithfulness to our charge. Finally, waiting means, number three, awareness of our need. This is where I was saying I wanted to take a step back and look at this theme of waiting in its broader context. Andrew Murray, the Dutch reformed missionary to South Africa, the 17th century. If we say we wait for Christ's coming, we must be sure to wait on his Holy Spirit now. Murray says that waiting, listen to this, is the sum total of the whole Christian life. Waiting is not one activity among other Christian activities. Waiting is the posture behind all of them. Conversion itself, think about it, is often talked about in terms of waiting on God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that they turn from idols to wait on the Lord. Andrew Murray, our first and highest duty is to wait on him to do the work that pleases him. Salvation brings us to God and teaches us to wait on him. And then we learn what is better, that waiting on God is itself the highest salvation of all. Waiting on God is the only true Christianity. Waiting is the posture behind Jesus' command in John 15, 4. Abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Apart from me, you cannot do anything that's waiting. When Jesus left the disciples on earth and he ascended into heaven, what posture did he leave them in? What was the first command Jesus gave to his disciples right before he left, or the last command? It wasn't to go. The last command was to wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise that is on from, or wait for the promise that is from on high. I mean, think about the great, just think about this moment for a minute. This is the first giving officially of the Great Commission. Every people, every person in the world needs to hear the gospel if they're going to have a chance to be saved. And you guys are the only ones who know about it. 
So the first thing I want you to do is sit around and wait for an undisclosed amount of time. I mean, you know that some of those apostles were type A. And they were like, we got a plan, we got conferences, we got to write books. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Why does he have them wait when they're the only people who know? Why does he have them wait for, by the way, it was 10 days? When he trying to show them, I don't need what you have to offer. And there's nothing you're actually going to do for me that's going to make any difference. What you need is the power from on high and one act of obedience under his direction. And by his power is worth all the activity that you could ever conjure up. So you sit down and wait on me. And you do this following me and not try to do it for me. Our waiting now is different, of course. But the posture is the same. We, of course, have received the Holy Spirit, but... We are still to be like Simeon and Anna who realize they are utterly impossible to do anything to bring about God's great redemption. And so our posture, while it is active, is one of waiting, saying, God, I need you to lead me. I need it to be your power because apart from that, I can't do anything. Friends, y'all, Jesus made such extraordinary promises about the power and the potential of the Holy Spirit in the church. Didn't he? I mean, you ever think of, it's like, there's no way we're taking these things seriously. I mean, nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. It is to your, what's that word? Advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. How absurd must that have sounded to those first disciples? To my advantage that you leave How awesome must it have been to have walked around with Jesus for three years? What is that experience like? You come back from a tough day of ministry and you got a theological question. Bam, Jesus answers it. Your small group runs out of checks mix. Bam, Jesus multiplies the checks mix so that there's 12 baskets left over. Your dog dies. Bam, Jesus raises your dog back from the dead. Your cat dies. Jesus digs a hole up. Bury the cat, get rid of it forever, right? little interpretation, but I mean, it probably didn't mean that, but how awesome would it have been to have walked around with Jesus and Jesus saying, it's to your advantage I go away because if I don't go away, the Spirit's not going to come. And the Spirit inside of you is a better advantage than Jesus, me, actually among you. Do you really think that's true? Do you and I live with the expectation that that's true? How excited would you be if Jesus came to join the staff of your church? I I think that would be an advantage. (laughs) And he would say, if you had a choice between me on the staff of your church and the Holy Spirit at work in the members of your church and leading your church, if you really understood the power and potential of the Holy Spirit, you would choose that every single time. You see how far I think we are from whatever it was that Jesus was talking about? And if that's true, if that advantage is real, it means that we have to be waiting on him. We have to be listening to him. The Holy Spirit shows up 59 times in the book of Acts, 59. In 36 of the 59, he is speaking. Now, I realize, I know where I am and I know what I believe and I'm where you all, almost all of you are on this. Things are different now than they were in the book of Acts. And there were some unique things happening with the apostles. They were writing the Bible, I get that. But you cannot tell me that the only book that we have that actually tells narrative about what it looks like to follow the Spirit of God is filled with a bunch of stories of people whose experiences have nothing in common with us. That just doesn't make sense. Here's what's frustrating. 36 times he speaks, it almost never tells us how he speaks. That's like my biggest question. Like Acts 13 too, the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have for them for ministry. And I'm like, how did he say it? Everybody have the same thought at once. Everybody get a peaceful, easy feeling that the little like emoticon thumb appear above Barnabas and Saul's head and said, this is the guy. How did it happen? I just want to know. There's ambiguity. And I would dare say that ambiguity is intentional, right? Because more havoc has been wreaked in the world following the words God just told me than probably any other phrase. And there's supposed to be a certain amount of humility when it comes to the Spirit's leadership that we do not even equate anywhere close to the authority we give the word of God. So there is ambiguity about how the Spirit is speaking, and we are submitting it to our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and there's this sense, okay? So yes, there's ambiguity about how the Spirit leads and speaks, but while there is ambiguity 
about how he speaks. There is no ambiguity on whether he speaks. John Newton, okay, just so you, this is, we're not talking like, like, like crazy outside Pentecostal. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, he said, and I quote, how can something the early church depended on so desperately for success now be regarded by the contemporary church as unnecessary? It was a failure to listen for the dynamic leadership of God that caused Israel to stumble. Wasn't it John chapter, or Joshua chapter 11? They charged forward in battle into a land that God wanted them to go into without asking God first what he wanted. The psalmist writing in Psalm 106 describes times of unfaithfulness in Israel simply by saying they waited not for his counsel. Andrew Murray again, the great danger in all of our assemblies is that in our consciousness of having our Bible, our past experience of God's leading, our sound doctrine, and our honest desire to do God's will, we trust in these and do not realize that we need and may have heavenly guidance with every step. That we could have his power if we waited on him. Waiting on him means this posture of waiting. I learned something that kind of provoked me. I'll just share with you and being really transparent. I hope it's okay. But I, um, I read this missions journal recently that said that the denomination that does the best job mobilizing its people for mission. I'm reading the page. I'm like, duh, the Baptist, okay? I mean, that's, missions is like our thing. The reform group, that's mission. I mean, name all the missions heroes. They all belong to us, right? Name all the great mission speakers today. They all seem to belong to ours, our camps. Flip the page. <laughs> you may have said the Baptist is what this article said. <laughs> but the denomination that does the best job per capita of mobilizing its people for missions is the Pentecostals. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this article said... I think it's accurate. It said, Baptist, Reformed, deep theology people, they love to talk about the weightiness of the task and the urgency of the need and, oh, we need that. But Pentecostals talk about the eminence of the Spirit and his dynamic leadership and what he has empowered you to do. And evidently, it is more motivating to be gift-driven than it is guilt-driven. There's a sense in which that posture of waiting on God says, I Yes, the weight of the nations is crushing to me. Where do we, I even start? I don't know what to do, but I know what the Spirit of God has put inside me, and I can say yes, and I can be obedient to him. Murray, what our Christianity needs is more of God. We are too occupied with the work and less with waiting on him. But the Lord is good to those who wait on him. And how good, none can tell except those who prove it by waiting. All church activities should be done in that posture of waiting. If we say we wait for Christ's coming, we must be sure to wait on his Holy Spirit now. Wakefulness to our task, faithfulness to our charge, awareness of our need and dependence on God to do what he said he would do with the Holy Spirit. To see regarding the second coming, we have questions. When and how will Jesus return? What's got to happen before he does? We likely will have those questions until he returns. Until then, I think we can all agree with Acts 1-6, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons but you will, and we might even translate that, you have received power. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and now you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That means the power is ours for the, for the taking and the mission is ours for completing. And our knowledge of the imminence of his return, our awareness that he stands at the door, that he is at hand, that he is ready to return, that gives us great confidence in our efforts and great purity in our motive. When I was in that very difficult time overseas that I described earlier, one of my mentors, he said, listen, you're working among Muslims. You see, you may not understand the significance of that, but the Muslim world is the one great civilization that has never seen a massive gospel explosion. We've seen other, other kingdoms, other groups. We've seen gospel surge. He said the Roman Empire resisted Christianity and the Roman Empire fell. For many years, the Roman Catholic Church tried to squelch out the gospel, but the Roman Catholic Church gave rise to the Protestant Reformation, the communist bloc, the Buddhist bloc. They crumbled, but the gospel surged. Islam is the one major civilization that has never seen a gospel major breakthrough. 
He said, so you're in the right place. Because we know that Christianity, Christian history cannot end until there's been a surge. And so you gotta be there. You gotta be faithful to that task. You gotta keep knocking because you know that it's coming. I repeat that same counsel now to every one of our teams that leaves our church to go in a Muslim unreached people group. I tell them the greatest days of God's power are ahead of us, not behind us. They have to be. Because we still got 6,400 unreached people groups, the majority of which are Muslim, that have still not seen this gospel resurgence. And I tell these members that leave our church, I'm like, you're gonna go and you're gonna feel like you're not doing anything. But you're gonna be like that woodpecker, that faithful, you know, that proverbial woodpecker that's just tapping away at that telephone pole, just da, 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 da. not feel like you're doing anything. All of a sudden, lightning strikes that pole, splits it in two, and that woodpecker's like, he flies off and gets his buddies and brings them back and is like, there she is, boys. Look at what I did. I'm like, that's what's just gonna be you. It's there you're gonna be and you're gonna be sharing faithfully and praying. You're gonna do it and all of a sudden, God is gonna fulfill that promise he said he was gonna fulfill and you get to be there when it happened. And when it happens, you're gonna back up and you'll probably be a little dazed, but you're gonna say, I knew it, I knew it. He said it would happen. And faithfulness was not bringing the power. Faithfulness was just knocking at the door of me and faithful to the task. I wanna be there when it happens. I want faithful people there when it happens. I believe that this is the master's task. I believe that I'm in a posture of waiting on him to give me the power to do what he said to do. I wanna be pure with the resources that he's given to me. Friends, Maranatha, the Lord is at hand. And the Lord is good to those who wait for him. May we live and carry out our ministries in that spirit today. Why don't you bow your heads if you would. God, I do believe that the greatest days of ministry are coming. What sobers me and terrifies me some is that there is no guarantee that you're gonna use the Western or the American church to do it. The future God of the nations is determined but we know that our future in many ways is in our hands. God, we're praying for a revival of that spirit of urgency, of that spirit of faith and trust. I pray that tonight you would work in the hearts of pastors who would not be satisfied with ministries that grow or plateau or stay in one location, but God, you would stir in them a yearning to see the seed of their church scattered throughout the world so that the nations may worship. Lord, you're coming. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.